Hey, how's it going, everybody? This is Jeremy coming at you with episode 154 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. We're back for our second episode this week. Remember, we got two every week. Monday, we got those interview shows we throw at you. Thursday, we mix it up. Sometimes it's history. Sometimes it's a profile of a movie or a person or a book. Today, it's going to be our second installment of the question and answer format. We really, I really love doing the first one. We got some good feedback on it, so we've collected some more questions. And that's what we're going to be throwing at you today. Some answers, some of my answers to your questions If you want to throw your questions at us, maybe have them answered here on the show. Best way, email us, info at whistlekick.com. Put the subject Q&A in your email, and we'll get that into the right folder, and we'll get it answered on the show here, as long as it seems to make sense, and, you know, up until the point where we're getting too many that we can't answer them all. Hopefully that doesn't happen for a little while, but anyway, moving on. If you want to check out more about what we do here at Whistlekick, There are a number of websites you should be familiar with. The first one, whistlekick.com. You know, we talk about that all the time. That's where you can get our sparring gear and our apparel. And that's really the hub for everything that we've got going on. The website for this show, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can check that out, past episodes and all that. You can see the show notes, photos, videos. You know, a lot of times if you're listening to something, you don't quite get the full effect. But for every episode we do, especially the interviews, You know, there are pictures, sometimes video of the people that we talk to. So if you head on over to the show notes, you can check out what they look like. Sometimes they look completely different from what you might expect. Other times, maybe you've got a really good mental picture. Who knows? But anyways, check out those websites. We've also got wholesale.whistlekick.com. And if you're just kind of popping around the internet, you know, you might bump into a lot of other sites that we do memes, uh, martialartsmemes.com. You know, we've got that site and and a bunch of other little stuff. Just because we're trying to put out good content. You know, we want everybody to enjoy being a martial artist and have entertainment and knowledge around their pursuit as a martial artist. And that's really the heart of this show. This is kind of a longer intro. I'm not sure why that happened. Maybe it's because I'm rambling. I am going completely off the cuff today. No notes, just answering these questions here for you today. So hang on, let's get into the first one. Now, this first question comes in, And it says, if the newer forms, it says here, katas, forms a student learns, contains more complex and advanced movements and sequences, why continue to work on the old ones? And if you're an instructor, you've probably had students ask you this question. You know, why do I have to go back and work on Chongji or Pinyon Shodan, Heian Shodan, Teki Shodan, uh, Form 1? You know, there's a lot of different names for those initial forms that end up being rather simplistic. And as we progress forward, yeah, they get harder, almost constantly harder. And most of what we need to work on, oftentimes, is in that newest form. So why do we want to go back? Why do we have to keep working on that? Now, I don't know the rank. I don't know the time involved. I don't even know the style other than, you know, probably a karate style, as it says kata here, that this person asking the question is. But here's how I look at it. Whenever I learn something, whether it's in martial arts or in life, it usually has an effect on other things that I quote unquote know. So as I progress as a martial artist, as I learn a form and I develop my skills, it allows me to go back to my previous forms and apply that new knowledge. And that form actually is no longer quite the same form. And I think you can take a look at any brand new white belt and any high ranking black belt doing in early form and compare them. And yeah, the movements kind of look the same, but they're not the same form. Just as a professional NASCAR driver is not going to drive the way that I do, or a professional dancer handles dancing versus, you know, what goes on in a club on Friday night. You know, it's just, it's a completely different experience when you have knowledge, when you're able to embody that knowledge and translate it into your physical action. So why do we continue to do forms and why do we continue to do the old forms? Because there's more to pull out of them. The more knowledge you have, the more you can embody. And that's probably the best word I can think of that form. And as we embody those forms, that's where the magic happens. You know, I'm not going to turn this into a, a episode about forms, 
frankly, I, I get frustrated at that back and forth argument. But the better you're able to live and train within the context of that form, the better a martial artist you're going to be. Hope that answers your question. Question two, what's one thing that all martial artists could do to improve? When I first read this question, I, I had some inner conflict in even putting it out on the show, because I think you could interpret answering this as having a bit of arrogance. And that was when I was considering it from the perspective of, well, you know, work on your flexibility. Well, that assumes that everyone should develop their flexibility better, that they you know, they're, they haven't reached some diminishing rate of return. Get stronger, uh, you know, become more accurate with your techniques. But then I hit on the answer that I find I'm giving everywhere I go. And it's something that I don't know you can ever develop too much of. And I don't know that there's ever a diminishing rate of return on it. And that's intensity. Whenever I see someone who is able to put intensity or realism into their movements, I see someone whose martial arts overall is good. And it's not that the intensity comes from being good. It's that being good comes from the intensity. I'm not going to fall back on the definition of martial arts that we, we talk about here on the show. I mean, we've, we've done that in quite a few episodes. The one of the things that is kind of important to pull out of that is that personal development part, right? So we're looking to become better in, in whatever way. We're, we're looking to become better people, better martial artists. And part of getting better is practice. I don't think there's anybody out there that's going to argue that. We have to do things with some repetition. So let's take the example of punching. If I punch a hundred times, maybe I'll get a little better. Well, if I'm punching poorly, if I'm punching wrong, I'm going to get worse, right? Because I'm cementing those motor patterns, those uh, central nervous system recruitments to do a poor punch. And if I ever need to use it, or if I'm demonstrating forms, or if I'm sparring, you know, whatever I'm using that punch for, it's going to be worse. Now, if I apply that same tactic to doing that punch a thousand times, 10,000 times, I'm going to continue to get worse because it's going to be that much harder to break out of that poor pattern. Now, this might not sound like it has to do with intensity, but bear with me, I'm going to tie it up. If that same person practices that punch with intensity, you know, meaning with power and some realism and reasonable accuracy, right? You know, not intentionally doing it poorly, even if they're only doing it 10 times, they're going to feel it. We all know what it's like to lift something heavy once, twice, five times versus picking up something light with more repetitions, right? So that's kind of what intensity does for our training. It makes the repetitions that we're doing more valuable. They're going to have more of an impact on what we're doing. And that's going to trickle down to every single thing that we're doing. You watch someone that does a form with intensity. And this, you know, this goes back to our first question today about, you know, why continue to do older forms? The older forms, the simpler ones are easier to demonstrate intensity, to learn that experience. And when somebody does a great form with a lot of intensity, it could be 45 seconds long and they may be sweating and panting and exhausted because you just watched them act out a battle and they kicked some butt. They won. They demonstrated that. So what could all martial artists improve? Their intensity, because I don't think there's a point where it's not worth working on. Question number three. I find sparring overwhelming. How do I get better? Well, I've got a couple things that you can you can try. So again, I don't know the rank of this person. I don't know a lot of their, their circumstances or any of their circumstances in this case. But I can infer some things about them. People that get overwhelmed by sparring tend to not enjoy sparring as much. They tend to be smaller. They tend to be newer, right? I mean, that not, not universal, but we can probably guess there's some lack of confident experience with their sparring. So what do we do when something is difficult? We break it down. 
I mean, that's kind of the way of martial arts, right? So how do you break down sparring? I've got three things that I love to recommend, and I'll go over them here. The first one, I've talked about this on the show before. It's the thing that I wish all schools did, the thing that I think makes it so much easier to bring together all of our training, and that's slow sparring. The idea of sparring such that striking is not the focus, but blocking is. Go so slowly with your partner that if any strike gets through, you are going too fast. A lot of magic seems to happen for people at this speed. They're able to think at a a speed where their reactions just kind of line up. You know, you can see what's coming. You can think about what to do, and you're fast enough because your opponent is moving slowly enough. Maybe I should say partner, not opponent. That you can make the block. You can make the counter. You can do what you want to do. And as you practice that, you can increase the speed. Slow sparring can become a little less slow sparring to moderate sparring to regular old sparring. But for a lot of people just jumping out there, even if it's not a a rank differential, even if you're not a white belt working with a black belt, some people just pick up sparring slower than others. So to have this drill to fall back on, I think is a really good thing. The second thing that I recommend, and this is really useful if you want more time or if your school isn't up for slow sparring, is shadow boxing. Practicing on your own. Now, you can take shadow boxing in a lot of different ways. You can just kind of work on the things that you have trouble with. You can work in front of a mirror and imagine what would I do if I came at myself with this? Oh, okay, I would do this block. I would do this counter. Maybe I would kick here. So you can start to think about it and really apply some intelligence to your own development, your your one-on-none sparring. A lot of people, when they shadow box, they're doing it as a cardiovascular drill. And that can be good, but I don't think that that's the best way to use shadow boxing. I think you can really get a lot more out of it than that. And the third thing, and this is something that I think works well for people of all skill sets, developing what I call core sequences, core combinations. Here's what I mean. When people panic, whether it's in a street confrontation or sparring or really anything, they fall back on their lowest level of training. You know, we like to think in martial arts that when the time is right, we will, you know, we'll we'll somehow miraculously do the exact right thing that our instructor taught us that one time. Well, that's not what happens. We tend to do the thing that we have done the most, the thing that we're most confident with. And if you've spent any time in martial arts, you're probably nodding along. You know exactly what I'm saying. Yeah, that's what people do. If someone's startled, do they generally step back into you know a good front stance, sparring stance, back stance, whatever, with their guards up? No, they tend to cover their head and flinch. You know, this is the whole strategy behind Mr. Tony Blower's spear system, that startle flinch response. That's why he developed that. And I think it's a perfect illustration. I can't argue with it. But I think that there are some ways that we can ingrain some more advanced combinations for a combat setting, whether it's a sparring setting or a street setting. We're talking about sparring here, so I'll focus on that. For most people in a sparring setting, the magic number of techniques to strain together in a combination is three. One is what most people do. Some people will do two. But when you start throwing three things at a time, the rate at which people score if it's points or make contact if it's not a point situation seems to go up dramatically. I have absolutely no science, no data to back this up. It's just my own personal observations. So if you develop three movement combinations, I think you'll see some things start to happen. Pick three that work well for you. You know, for me, this might be back fist off the front hand, roundhouse kick off the back leg, step behind sidekick. You know, that that's kind of the way that I might spar. Well, I'm not just going to do that one time or five times or 10 times. I'm going to do it 10, 20 times a day, maybe multiple times per day until I almost struggle in a sparring situation that when I throw that back fist, that I don't throw a roundhouse kick. For some of you out there, round kick, turning kick, you know what I mean, right? 
Mawashi Gary. I want to beat that sequence into my body so it becomes automatic. So that when I see an opening and my body instinctively goes for that back fist, I just keep moving with it. Once I've got one down, I'm going to add a couple more. To have three, five, ten of these sequences really seems to work well for people. It's something that I've experimented with personally and in training people, and I see some benefit from it. So those are my three suggestions, slow sparring, shadow boxing, developing some core combinations. And our last question for today, question number four, my school doesn't teach any martial arts weapons, but I want to learn. What can I do to learn on my own? Well, I wish every school would teach weapons at least a little bit. I know that not every school has the knowledge internally, but I think that there's benefit for people to externalize that training beyond their body. There's a saying amongst most martial artists that train with weapons that the weapon is really an extension of yourself. So there's additional knowledge of how the body works and of how you train as you're training with weapons. Plus, let's face it, they're fun. And depending on what you're training with, it can be really applicable. My personal recommendation for starting with weapons is really the weapon that most schools start with. It's it's the bow, the staff. Now, if you don't have the knowledge or someone to teach you, if you don't have the space in your home, training with a bow, which traditionally is supposed to be taller than you, can be kind of tough, right? So we can just think about sticks in general because they're simple. First off, they're not bladed. They're not pointy. So there's less risk to you, to your family, your walls, your pets. All these things matter when you're training on your own because you probably don't have your own large, purposefully designed workout space at your home. Maybe you have access to one and that's fantastic, but my recommendations are still going to apply. When we think about sticks beyond the bow, we're talking the Joe, the shorter bow, or a kubaton, you know, a, a small length stick that often is attached to the keys. Uh, Eskrima stick. I mean, you can start with one. There are some basic movements that you can learn fairly simply online. Now, I'm not a big fan of online training because I think it leaves a lot to be desired. But if you're already training at a school and you're you're learning the way that martial arts should be taught, I think there's some things that you can gather from watching videos online. And let's face it, if you've got a stick however long it is, there's only so many ways that you can manipulate it without hitting yourself in the head. Now, of course, if you're looking to use this for self-defense purposes, and some people that are learning Kubaton or, or an Eskrima do want to learn it for that purpose, that's going to be a little tougher because maybe you don't have a person to work with. And the moment you start bringing another person in, the idea of learning for from, you know, an online video, my recommendation doesn't become nearly as strong. But if you're, you know, let's say you want to learn how to do a forum with a, a staff, you can pick that up fairly well. And if you've, you know, achieved some rank, you know, maybe you're some kind of middle to upper rank in another martial art, you're going to be able to translate that out with some practice. So, you know, is that a perfect solution? Absolutely not. What's another way you could do it? You could seek the advice of your instructor for training somewhere else. If your instructor's not cool with that, I, I very lightly would suggest maybe that's not somebody that you want to train with, but I'm not going to tell you flat out to leave your school. Because if you love the school, if you love the people and everything else, but this works for you, well, then maybe you've got to make a compromise here with the suggestion that I made already. There we go. Four more questions. My thoughts on the answers. What did you think of my answers? What do you think of these questions? Do you have some advice that's completely different or maybe you want to add on to the things that I've said? The best place to leave those comments, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. From there, you can sign up for our newsletter. You know, we're always talking about that newsletter. We send it out really just a couple times a month. Sometimes we send out coupons for stuff. Sometimes we make announcements like the last episode, episode, the last issue, we dropped an announcement on an upcoming course that some of you may know about. I'm not going to get into it any more than that, but watch, there will be more information really soon. And we tell you who's coming up on the show for interviews. We usually have a few in the can and we let you know, hey, 
who's coming up. And sometimes we even tell you what dates so you can wait for those and be excited. Check out whistlekick.com for everything we've got going on over there. And if you just want to hang out with us, get to us on social media, YouTube, Pinterest, Instagram, Facebook, that's our primary. Uh, what am I missing? Twitter. You know, we've got all those. If you want to email me directly, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Thanks so much for listening. I hope you have a great day. Send us in some questions for issue number three of this Q&A format. Until next time, train hard, smile, have a great day.